All right, thank you for attending this webinar. And again, welcome. This is one of our webinars that's part of our Evaluating Resources series. So this webinar is about what about stuff I find on the internet, knowing when to use and what to trust um, on the internet. So I am Erin Goldbranson, and joining me is Kim Burton. I Hello. am the one of two liaison librarians for the College of Health Sciences, and Kim is one of two education liaison librarians. Um, so that's a little bit about us. And as we get into the content now, we, we like to just let you know we're real people with our webcams, yes. but <laughs> I'm going to turn that off now so it's not distracting. Okay, and now we'll go ahead and get into what our objectives are tonight. But before we do that, like I said, it is a series um, that we've been presenting about evaluating resources. It's a large topic, um, how to evaluate materials. So we have actually divided up that topic of evaluating resources into many different webinars and we present them as a series. On the PowerPoint, if you go ahead and um, if you do have those slides, you can link directly to archived webinars from the rest of the series. Uh, so the first one was, what is the stuff? It's how to identify materials that you found in the library to, to figure out what is it. Is it a newspaper article? Is it a scholarly peer-reviewed article? Um, you can link to that and watch that webinar. There's another one we did that was the different styles of evaluation or different methods of evaluation. Um, and you can watch that one. And then there was another webinar we did about um, using the right resource at the right time. So, you know, sometimes one material is useful in one scenario and then in another context, you need a different type of material. So you can watch all of those webinars that we've already done in this series um, and watch the whole series. And then you'll know everything that we can tell you about evaluating resources. Uh, so tonight though, or in this webinar, our objectives are uh, looking at what you find on the internet, on the World Wide Web. How do you critically evaluate resources that you come across through a Google search or just links that you find or anything that's just out there on the internet? Um, part of that, part of what we're going to talk about, Kim is going to walk us through identifying fake, biased, or satirical news content. Those are those are actually all different things, and so we're, she's going to talk about what does each of those things mean, and then how do you identify it. Um, and I'm going to also talk about protecting yourself from really potentially harmful fake or misleading resources on the internet. And misleading can take um, a lot of different forms and potentially harmful can take a lot of different forms. So we're going to talk about those things um, in some different scenarios. And we do like to have this disclaimer here that all the links that we're going to show you in this webinar are being used as examples. So we don't own or use any of these um, websites necessarily. We're using them to educate you, to instruct you on evaluating resources. But none of these things um, are ours. And doesn't mean that we advocate for the use of any of them because we're showing them in this webinar. All right. So before I hand it over to Kim, I'm just going to talk a little bit about why are we even talking about this as part of our evaluating sources series? Why does it matter um, to evaluate what you find on the internet? Well, one reason is because the internet at large is separate, it's different than using library online resources. Um, this is something that students will sometimes say to us as librarians, you know, maybe they went onto the library website. Um, I'm just going to go there real fast. And they, let's say they went to select a subject or they went to databases A to Z and they used a library database, say this one, and they found some resources, some articles online. It is online. Yes, we are online right now on the Walden Library website, but we're not just on the internet at large. <laughs> this database, usually we use databases to search inside journals to find articles in the library. 
This is a, a resource that we have paid to have access to. The Walden Library pays for it. Um, if you were not a Walden student, you saw that I logged in. If you didn't have a login, you wouldn't be able to access it. Other universities have the same database. It's a it's a very it's a good database um, for the content that it has and to research um, business topics. And so this is a, a resource that libraries pay to have access to. Um, it has things in it, journal articles in it that you would not be able to find just out on the internet. That's probably something you've experienced that maybe you um, come across the, the name of an article and you can't get it for free just by Googling it. Um, if it's something that we have paid to have access to in our databases, you'd have to go into a Walden Library database to get it, to actually access the full text. Um, so the library, again, the content that we have, yes, it's online. I am connected to the internet and I'm accessing these things through the library, but that's the key part. I'm accessing these things through the Walden Library. Um, they are paid for resources that we have to pay to have access to. So that is different than just going to a Google search and typing in, you know, business leadership articles. I'm not going to get the content that I would be able to see through the Walden Library. So that's just something we like to address because students have said that, you know, well, I was told I'm not allowed to use an online resource, so I can't use anything from the library. No, that's not what that means. Um, if you are ever told that, you know, don't use online resources or don't use internet resources, that means you can still use the Walden Library, um, use the content that is available through the Walden Library that you wouldn't be able to find just through a Google search. So the other reason we want to talk about evaluating internet resources is, sure, you probably won't be able to use a lot of internet resources in your time as a student at Walden. Most of your assignments and discussion posts are going to ask for those scholarly articles that you get through the Walden Library. But we still want you to be able to protect yourself as an information consumer. We all take in a lot of information every day from news sources, from just informational websites, um, through things that our friends or our family post through social media. We're bombarded really with information all the time. We all consume vast amounts of information. And so we wanna make sure that you know as just a human being in, in this technology driven age um, that you can protect yourself from whatever you find um, on the internet and to be able to discern what's a good source and what's not a good source regardless of how you're going to use it. Um, and so, you know, that is a danger of um, not being critical or not evaluating internet resources is that you're then in danger of spreading false news, um, you know, potentially scaring people where there's no, you know, no need to be scared or um, really just eroding your own reputation and your own credibility if you share something that is turns out not to be factual. Um, it can make you look bad. It can make all of us look bad. So those are just some of the reasons I know that you won't have um, a lot of opportunities as a Walden student to use internet resources in assignments or discussion posts. But really just as a as a person, it's good to be knowledgeable about these things, again, for your own reputation or credibility. And sometimes there are times um, in assignments where you might even be asked to use an internet resource. So you would definitely then want to be able to identify a good and credible resource, even if you find it on the internet. All right, and now I'm going to hand it over to Kim, and she's going to give us some examples. Okay, great. Um, let me just share my screen with you. There it is. So are you seeing my screen here? Yes. The, the URLs. Okay, great. So one of the first things that we can do when we're um, online and we want to be aware of what we're looking at is take some time to actually look at the different URLs that are out there. So you know 
what you have an idea of what you're looking at. Um, so I have some common um, endings for URLs here. Uh, the most common of which is the .com. So the first one I have here, Amazon.com. .com stands for commercial, and usually this is a commercial website, entertainment website, a news website. Um, it's just a general business sort of uh, website. Um, another thing you can find when you're looking at URLs is a country code. So the next example here, I have an IE. An IE stands for Ireland. Um, if this was a United Kingdom website, it would have UK in there. Um, again, it's just like a little clue. So when you're looking at this at a website, look at the URL so you have an idea of where it's coming from. Websites that end in EDU are education websites, um, usually uh, higher education, such as universities, uh, but also um, uh, elementary schools and other schools um, at different levels. Uh, government websites usually end in GOV when you're in the United States. Um, so here's the Colorado uh, state website ends in GOV. And the United States also has military websites. So if you have a website that ends in MIL, that's one of our mili that's a would be a United States military website, which some people might actually access if you're looking for things like statistics or uh, reports um, that you might need for a weekly assignment or a uh, course project. And uh, finally, there is the .orgs, uh, which is for organizations, often nonprofits. Uh, but you have to be a little careful just because something ends in a .org does not mean it is what it says it is. You know, there's ways that people can get websites to have different endings, um, different um, codes at the end when they are not actually a, you know, a, a nonprofit organization. They may actually be a disreputable website that might actually be wanting to take uh, advantage of you. So the first thing you want to do is look at these URL, see if there's any clues there, and then take that with a grain of salt and continue on to look at some other clues. Uh, one of the things you can do when you're on a website is look at the, the about button. There should be an about button. You should be able to get in there and look at it and learn about that website. Um, if there's nothing up there, look at the footer. Uh, if a lot of times, just for aesthetic reasons, people might put or companies might put the about button at the bottom of the website. Um, and then go and look at other websites and see if the information contained in the one that you're looking at is also available elsewhere. If it's only in this one area, if only one news organization is reporting on this, that might be a sign, a warning sign that this may not be um, a legitimate uh, website. So what I want to do is actually go out and show you a couple of different websites. And then I'm going to ask you guys if you can tell me which one of these um, are fake, and which one might be the real website. Um, and I want to take some time to show you some educational websites. So the first one is called All About Explorers. Okay, um, allaboutexplorers.com. Um, it says right here that it's going to show me everything you've ever wanted to know about every explorer who ever lived. So that's kind of a tall order. Um, I'd be pretty impressed if they could actually pull this off, but it's a great looking website, isn't it? You know, they have links here for explorers, A to Z, a link for teachers, um, a link for about this site. There's also a link up here for about this site where I can go and click on here to find out about the authors to see who produced this website. So we have uh, a bunch of different people here. Um, some of them have some credentials here uh, Dr. E Oops, Dr. Eaton Crow has a has a bunch of um, credentials. I'm not even familiar with some of those. Um, and then we have uh, Locked in Brig Esquire, who is the legal and political analyst, as well as the Donut Glazer Laureate for this website, which is kind of an interesting title that I'm not that familiar with. So that's our first website we're looking at. The next one is called um, Enchanted Learning. Now this website it's kind of plain looking. Um, I think the All About Explorers website was a lot more entertaining, a little bit more theatrical. This is just very basic, lots of links here, um, very uh, basic um, pictures and animations. Let's go to the About button. Um, and here it talks about Enchanted Learning, how it was developed. It has the names of the people who developed with links to contact them. Uh, we can also go to the Contact Us link, 
And you can see that they're providing us a lot of information to get in touch with them, not just with questions, but you know, different reasons. If you forgot your password or you're looking for specific things for requests. So they're making it easy for you to um, get out and um, contact them. Um, I also see that it has today's date on it. So that's nice. That makes me think that it is being updated regularly. And the final website is the OMA Prima Foundation, which is a foundation that was um, created to help solve the never ending question of what came first, the chicken or the egg. And it is their lifelong duty to uh, find out the answer to this question. Um, I see that it was, it's updated, it has today's date, so it must be updated daily. Um, I'm just going through here a little bit. Um, let me see. There's no about button. There is a home page. This is the home page, and they have this person here, but there's really no information about him. Uh, when I click on the contact us, all I'm getting is a little pop up. Oops, on my other screen. Um, I'm just getting a little pop up on my other screen to send them an email. Um, I'm not. I don't have any phone numbers. I have no way to get in touch with them. Um, so this is this is a little a little odd. But all right, so this is the, the Ova Prima Foundation. What I wanna do is ask you guys, what you think is the real one and which one, which, uh, which of the two would be fake? So let me just pull up this. I want you to pick which one you think is um, the real site. So go ahead and vote. Okay. Great, so now I can, am I sharing this? <laughs> I think you need to close yeah. it first. Oh, okay. Close. There you go, and that should give you the option to share. Okay, share, there it is. All right, good thing that we have um, Aaron with us. So um, are you seeing those results? Yes. Okay. Great so job, everyone. Everyone, was great. everyone that it correct that Enchanted Learning is the correct um, website. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me just close that out. I'm all over the place here. Um, what I could tell you about this Enchanted Learning, if we go back to the home page, you can see it says right here that children need the clearest, simplest computer interface. Um, and our materials created so the navigation and controls are intuitive. And that's exactly what they did here. And that's why it looks this way. If we go back to the All About Authors, um, All About Explorers, we notice that some of these things they were saying are a little far-fetched. Everything you ever wanted to know. These bios are obviously fake. If I scroll to the bottom, it actually says, I'm not buying it, click here for the real story. Um, this website was created by educators. Uh, to test students. So they have it for students to go out and see how they can go online. They can find something that looks really nice. Some information is correct, but there might be false information in there as well. So it's just a learning tool for students. And the last one, the Ova Prima Foundation, um, this is just for fun that someone had put together. Um, there's a lot of inconsistencies that I could show you if I went through all these links. But one of the main ones is right here in the beginning, it says, you know, since 1887. And then the second paragraph, it says that it was founded in 1865. So right there is just a discrepancy that kind of pops out at you. Now I wanna go and show you um, a couple of other websites. Um, and these are kind of, I'm gonna put them in the environmental uh, category. This one right here is um, a force for all, the FSC forever. Um, this is um, a website for forest, um, let me pull this up here, uh, forest conservation. Uh, I'm going to look at the URL. It's a .org, uh, but it also has E-N-U-S. And that is because this happens to be the United States version of this um, company, this um, organization. I want to find out some information. So what I can do, I can click on this, uh, what we do. We have a mission. We have um, facts and figures. We can go to who we are, let me get this up. And it talks about their history, their membership. You can go on their governance to find out who they are, who's sitting on their governing board. They give you their financial reporting. They're very upfront with everything. They want you to know everything that they're doing because um, they want you 
to trust them. The next website I want to go to is the DHMO.org, the Dihydrogen Monoxide Research Division. And this is a website um, that is, wants to talk about the controversy surrounding DHMO. So when I'm looking here, um, I see things like the DHMO conspiracy. Um, and when I see something like conspiracy, it's, it brings an alarm because that, that's you know a big claim of conspiracy. You know, that makes me kind of think like, really, is it a conspiracy? Are they coming at me at a specific angle? I want to find out more about this. So I'm going to look for an about button and I see that they don't have an about button. So that's that's kind of strange. I don't like that. I want to find out more information about them and they're not providing me information. Just lots of links to other areas and special reports, some frequently asked questions. Let's go to the, my last website and this is um, the Pacific Northwest tree octopus, uh, which happens to be endangered. And this is a website that is here to help um, help it from going to extinction. Um, they have a lot of information here. Uh, you can even look up some sightings from people who have found some uh, tree octopus or octopi in their area. Um, when I go to the about, I get a lot of information about tree octopus or octopi. Um, so let me go down to the footer. Um, it doesn't say much here, except that this uh, is was created. This website was created by somebody named Lyle Zapato. So that's somebody I'm going to want to look up. Um, I want to do a separate search to see who this person is. And um, he is associated with the Kelvinick University branch of the Wild Haggis Conservation Society. So that's something else that I'm going to want to look up to make sure to see if this is a real website. So I'm going to go back to another quiz here. Let's see if I can get this one a little better. Um, okay. Hold on one second. And thank you for um, bearing with me. Hmm. Okay. I'm not, I can't seem to pull up the poll. Oh, yeah, hold on. Maybe it's going to let me do it. I can there do it is. For you. I, I found it. I'm so sorry, Erin. Okay. <laughs> okay, I launched it. Um, and I want you to pick which one you think is the correct website the Forest Stewardship Council, Dehydration Monoxide Research Division, or the Endangered Pacific Northwest Octopus. And I'm just going to wait a minute to see if we can get in, see if anybody else wants to vote. percent have voted. Okay. All right, so about half of you have answered. Um, I'm going to close the poll. And we have kind of a split result. There's a you guys did a couple different things. Um, I'm thinking most of you picked the uh, Pacific Northwest tree octopus, but I have to say that's not correct. This is not a real website. So um, I think this is someone who just wants to have a lot of fun. Um, let me see, am I sharing my website or am I on the? Um, we see the website. Okay, great, okay. So uh, this actually is just for fun. Um, it's uh, some, I have to give them credit though. They put a lot of, um, effort into this uh, to make it a lot of fun to go out there. They even have people mailing in sightings of octopus in um, trees. Uh, the dehydratedmonoxide.org, um, that is not a real website. There was no about button. They use terms like conspiracy, which can make uh, ring alarms. Uh, there's no contact information here. I do see that there's a press kit link. Uh, that does give the username and the uh, password name. So if I put this in here, oops, uh, it brings me to this website, uh, this section where it actually does say that this is um, not a real website. The original purpose was just a way for the, the writer to kind of blow off steam and point out how some websites can be very devious and you have to be careful about it. And for any of you who might have a little bit of a chemistry background, uh, DHMO is just another term for H2O, which is um, the chemical compound for water. 
The actual real website was the Forest Stewardship Council website. Um, and I could tell that this was a real website because they were being so upfront with me. They were telling me where the money is going. I have a link to their board of um, their board of directors where I can contact them. They have a list of their governance. They're putting out um, what they do and who they are and being very transparent uh, with you because they want you to uh, donate to their organization. So that's just a couple ways that we can go out and you can kind of look at some of these websites to see if um, they are actually real websites or not. Um, now I want to go and talk a little bit about the different types of websites that are out there. And um, I'm going to be talking about these different ones, but I'm just going to go out and start showing you some examples. Um, the first website I want to talk to you about are um, fake and misleading websites. Um, what I want to do is just go here to Google. And let's say you want to do some research on Martin Luther King. So let's say you want to put in um, Martin Luther King and you hit return. And we get, oh, it's not coming up, I'm sorry. Um, martinlutherking.org because that is, you know, .org, it's probably going to be um, a website that has a lot of good information about him. And you see what happened is I'm actually blocked from accessing this because I'm on my work computer and um, they block websites that contain hateful messages. So I'm not allowed to go to this website. There's actually a, um, a group of uh, white supremacists who have taken this domain name and they have created a website um, and they pretend that it's about Martin Luther King, but it's actually filled with lies. And this is an example of a fake website. These are websites that are made up stories or um, hoaxes that are delivered under the pretext of actual news-based um, websites or fact-based websites when they are completely fabricated. They are designed to mislead you, to generate fear or panic. Um, you have to, so have to be very aware of these types of sites. I want to show you the actual website, if you wanted to go to Dr. Martin Luther King's website, is the kingcenter.org. So this is the accurate site. Um, but you can see how misleading it is because martinlutherking.org has that .org. Some kids might think that this could be an actual site when in fact it is not. Um, the next site I want to show you is um, a news site for, st st excuse me, satirical news. Um, this is the Daily Match. Uh, Satirical News is a news site that is a parody of actual events and news. Uh, it's for entertainment purposes only. It's just for fun. What they do is they often mimic reputable news sites uh, using information or recent stories and then kind of taking them out of context and exaggerating them a little. So um, some of the stories here, a woman decides train is perfect place to have incredibly personal phone conversation. Best man's speech hits all the wrong notes. You know, I mean, like these aren't major headlines. These are kind of just funny, supposed to be taken um, as tongue in cheek um, and to make you laugh. Um, so how can we find out if this is a real news outlet or a satirical news outlet? Well, we're gonna look for the about and I don't see the about here, but I could scroll down to the bottom and there it is. So I'll click on the about and they are, um, right out front with you, they tell you they're a satirical website that, you know, it's just spoofs. I'm sorry. Um, it's just spoofs. It's just for fun. So uh, that's what it is. And you can always double check when you're looking at these websites if you're not sure. The next type of website I want to talk about is biased or slanted news. And this is kind of hard to actually show you a website that has that talks about biased or slanted news. And news is delivered from a particular point of view. Um, that may rely on propaganda or opinions rather than facts will be considered biased or slanted news. Um, and it's out there a lot. It's very prevalent. Sometimes it's hard to realize it's uh, biased news. Um, sometimes it's an opinion or an editorial. It's not fake. It's not wrong. It's just not your opinion. It may not be your beliefs, but it's somebody else's. So it's coming from their viewpoint and it might be slanted or biased that way. Um, 
Some of them are a little bit more biased than others. Some of them are specifically out there with an agenda to um, give you misleading information by exaggerating news for an opposing uh, viewpoint so that you will be more likely to agree with them than the opposing viewpoint. Since I can't really go out and show you some websites that are biased, since it's so hard to really determine my biases as opposed to somebody else's, I wanna share this website called allsides.com. Um, and what they do is they can help you look at the web, at the news through three different lenses. Uh, the first thing they do is they allow you to go and uh, do a search I'm sorry, they allow you to go in and vote on um, different websites. They have these news sites here, these news outlets, and they have um, done a lot of research on them and they've uh, put this out here with, and you can vote to see which one, which side do you think this leans on? If it's far left, a little left, center, right, or far right. And you can, eat, they have, after the research, they have applied their rating. You can agree or disagree. Um, it has the community feedback here, but um, a lot, most of them seem to be pretty right. You know, most of the green ones, um, the public are generally believing in. So if you're looking at a, a website or a news outlet, you can look it up here and say, okay, generally this guy might be a little bit more to the right than the left. The next thing that they do is when they show you the news, they provide those three lenses. They have the same story and then they have it from a news outlet that is um, has been rated in the center bias, one that's from the far left and one that's from the far right. So you can see how other people um, are reporting the same story just from their point of view, from where they are coming from. So I thought this was kind of a cool little website to look at, um, especially because it does that with the three different uh, lenses to look at stories. And the last website I want to show you um, is a, a clickbait website. Um, clickbait are sites that uses sensationalized, misleading, often exaggerated headlines and images to get you to visit the website. Um, the articles then deliver information that is usually not related to the original eye-catching piece. Um, it's pretty much basically just to generate advertisement or revenue. Um, so BuzzFeed is an example of that. They have a, a lot of headlines here, but no stories. You have to click on everything to access the stories. They have lots of photos here. Um, things that want that catch your attention that you want to look at and then you click on it and then it ends up you even having to click on three other clicks to get to the actual story. One thing that you should also be careful about when you're in um, these types of websites is something uh, called native advertising um, and that's when they have something that looks like a story but is actually an advertisement so you have to be careful um, it looks like you're just going to read the story but really it's an advertisement for a company or a product and that is a uh, what a clickbait website looks like and those were all links to all of those websites if you wanted to look at them so how do you protect yourself when you're out there, when you're looking at all these websites and you're finding this, these fake news. You have to look at everything as a critical news consumer. You need to analyze what you're looking at and then you need to share and act upon that responsibly. If you see something out there that is um, exaggerated, um, uses terms like you know, conspiracy or something like that. Is this something you want to share? You want to make sure that you do your research and that you make sure that it is accurate and true before you share it, because this is your credibility, uh, your reputation. If you're sharing this news and spreading it, you're going to want to make sure that it is correct. And how do you do that? By evaluating it. Um, this is a link here to the um, evaluating the the library's guide to evaluating resources. There's a lot of great information there. I'll just go click on it to bring this up. And it tells you how you can evaluate different stories. Um, you can look at the author. These are questions to ask. Um, look at the author. You know, who are they? What else have they written about? Look at the publisher. Are they, um, on the left side or are they on the right side? Look at the piece, was it you know, printed recently? And then when you're reading the content, you can ask these questions too. Um, is it objective? 
Is it using sensational language? Does it sound like it has a bias? Just questions to ask yourself as you're going through these articles. Um, you can double check the information on other websites. And then you can also use investigative resources. And I have a couple examples here of uh, websites that um, actually search for um, fake news or you know, sometimes things get out there. Is it true or not? You can go to these websites and uh, look them up. And I have a couple of them here. So Snoops is one. You can type in, let's say, um, what was the, oh, the super volcano. Let's look up the super volcano on Snoops. And it'll let us know of any stories about the super volcano, um, if there's any fact to those super volcanoes. So here's a couple of the stories. And this was a rumor about the animals fleeing about a super volcano in Yellowstone. Um, here's another website, Politic PolitiFact, which I have to reload. Um, so PolitiFact is another uh, website where you can type in your um, type in a story or a question, and then they'll look it up for you, and they'll they'll let you up tell you if it's true or not. A lot of times, sometimes it's, it's half true, um, sometimes maybe just a little bit false, and unfortunately it's not loading for me right now. Yep, it's unresponsive. Okay, so but that's just another one that you can look at, and uh, factcheck.org is also um, another website where you can go and um, double check anything that you're finding on the web. Another thing that you can do is um, verify images. A lot of times, unscrupulous reporters might use images, recycle images, I should say, images that were used for another story. They can pull up years later and tag them with a recent story when, in fact, that image has nothing to do with it. Um, this is just another way to kind of generate um, stronger feelings about a story. I'm sorry. Um, to get you um, upset about something. Uh, what you can do if you see an image that is upsetting and a, a story that seems a little bit sensational is double check that image, see if it is real. Um, this is a link to a guide we have at the library that will help you determine that. Um, and I'll just go and show you how we can do this. I'm gonna go to the Walden University uh, Facebook page. And here's a picture of me and Meryl Streep when we went to the Oscars last year. Um, so let's say you came across this and you don't believe that I went to the Oscars with Meryl, who's my best, best friend. What you can do is you can right click on the image and then click on copy image address. We're going to go to Google and we're going to click on the images link up on the right hand side. And then in this toolbar, um, search bar, excuse me, we're going to click on the uh, icon of the camera and we're going to paste that URL in there and hit search by image. And it's going to search for this image and there it found it. Come on. Well, that's strange. So when I did this earlier today, it brought back all of the images of uh, Meryl at the, um, the Oscars. Let me try this again. I'll try it one more time. Maybe my computer is just not liking me today. Oh, there it is. Okay, so there I am with Meryl. But if you scroll down, you see here's the same photo and I'm not in it. So obviously that was a fake photo um, of me and Meryl at the, uh, the Oscars. I did not go to the Oscars with Meryl. And I'm sorry about that little uh, technical glitch there. I'm glad we got it fixed for you. Um, and again, this is a link uh, to that goes over the steps on how you can <clears throat> verify images um, online. And now I'm going to go ahead and switch this over back to Erin. Thank you. And I'm just going to talk um, a little bit about just other information or other websites um, that you would find online. And just to reiterate some of these um, some of these skills that we're talking about, like double checking the information. Can you find the same thing on another website? You know, can you find um, 
something that backs up a claim that you find on a website. So I'm talking about health information um, as my examples, not just because I'm a health liaison librarian, but also because um, that has a lot of potential for harm. If you find health information that is not verifiable and if you um, take its advice, for instance, um, so sometimes in assignments or in discussions, uh, you can sometimes use non-library resources. Like um, if you did, for instance, need some statistics, just like what percentage of adults has diabetes in the United States, something like that, we could definitely find that um, through a government website. And that is what usually a librarian would suggest to you, that you go to something like the CDC um, and you pull up a statistic there because it's a government website, um, a government entity where they collect that kind of statistic. Um, but then there, there's so many other um, websites out there that are health related um, that are not government entities uh, or um, they're also not credible organizations. So sometimes with like really rare diseases, you might find an organization that is um, like a nonprofit that's committed to fundraising to find a cure for that. They can also be a good credible source if it's a really rare disease to find information about it. But then you've got a lot of other um, not so good information on health topics out there. So. Anytime you're on a website that is related to health or any other topic, you want to look for research that backs up the claims that they're making on that website. Are they citing sources? Are they, um, you know, talking about a new treatment and then they're linking to the actual research study? That would be a good sign if they're then linking to the original research, even if they're just sharing it in a news fashion. Um, another thing I, I tell people, you know, you want to be really wary of blogs or anecdotal information. So, you know, someone writing on their blog, oh, this, um, this supplement was really great for me and it cured my rheumatoid arthritis, you know, that's one person, that's their blog happy for them, that's great if they feel better, um, but it may not be backed up by actual clinical trials or research studies that that supplement is really helping them. So um, those are just a few, a few tips. And I wanna use an example of um, a website that I actually do see students sometimes citing um, when they are able to use internet resources. Um, so, Here's one that is a good, a good source of information, the Mayo Clinic. Maybe you've heard of the Mayo Clinic. It's an actual real clinic where people get treated. Um, you can see up here at the top, you can request an appointment, you can find a doctor. Um, so there are people who are actually patients at the Mayo Clinic. But beyond that, they also have a variety of information sources about different diseases and conditions. So these are experts who are writing this content. And then these are, you know, sites, they, if you were a patient there, your doctor might say, you know, okay, um, I want you to go home and, and look up congenital heart disease, da, 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 da. You can find it on our clinic's website. You can learn about it there. Um, but it's also for anybody. You don't have to be a patient at the Mayo Clinic to, to see their uh, helpful information about different diseases and conditions. So this is a good example of something, you know, it's out on the internet, but I can, I can trust this uh, website. They are a well-recognized clinic treatment uh, center, and they also have all of the, all of this wealth of information on their website. It's a good place just to get background information. Um, from a student perspective, that's what I would use it for. You know, using it for um, background information, they might even give some statistics on here, like how common it is, um, you know, about whatever disease they're talking about. So um, it is under, you know, listed under their patient care and health information, but you could find some things here that would be helpful in as a student in your work that, you know, there could be some statistics and you could trust this. Um, this is a, 
a good place to go again for that background information. Now I've unfortunately also sometimes seen people cite this website. I don't know if it's because they both start with M <laughs> or what, um, but I think it's be, I think honestly it's because this Mercola website it does come up a lot um, when you Google certain things if you use Google as your search engine. So let's take a, a quick look at this. One of the first things that jumps out to me on this website um, is that there's a cart at the top. So right away, that tells me this website is selling something or many things. And sure enough, look, here's shop over here. If I click on shop, um, it's gonna bring me to health products, supplements, um, all kinds of products that this website sells. Now, it is um, a website run by a Dr. Mercola. And this is one of those instances where it's a really good idea to then, well, let's go search this person's name. Who is this person? And if I just search for this doctor's name, um, yes, that website comes up as one of the first thing, but it does tell me right here that it is selling wellness products. There are, um, there are some things that seem like news or information, but the main purpose is a .com. The main purpose here is for this Dr. Mercola to sell his products. Um, and if I look over here, this is coming from Wikipedia, so I would then maybe want to go look at yet another source to see um, more information about this person. But sure enough, it you know he he does have a a degree. He is an osteopathic physician that is different than a medical doctor, an MD. Um, so that is a little different. And mostly he is selling dietary supplements and medical devices through his website. And so it, it does accurately describe him as, you know, he's not just a doctor, he's a web entrepreneur. So anything I find, oh, and look right here, I see something from a, a place called Quack Watch um, where he's been ordered to stop making illegal claims, probably about the effectiveness of the things that he sells. Um, there is some some controversy. So here's something from a magazine where is he a visionary or a quack? You know, maybe there's some controversy there. Maybe some things are are uh, useful and some things are not so useful. So I would definitely dive into a lot of research um, for from other sources with any information, any um, health news that I find through this website. I would want to go back it up and look for research articles, even if I don't read the whole research article, but just go see, is there actually research about this? Read the conclusions at least, see if any of that is accurate that I find there. So this is just a really good example of, you know, there could even be statistics here about some of the um, diseases that his products are meant to treat but I'm not sure I will even want to cite it for a statistic. I would rather go someplace like the Mayo Clinic or the CDC, look for that statistic or that information from another source. It's not to say that everything I find here is false. It's just to say a lot of it is probably written in a way where it's supposed to make me want to go click on shop and buy a supplement. Um, it is a .com and he is a web entrepreneur. So um, this website is meant to sell his products. So that is one example. And I actually, this is not in the slide deck because I literally just thought of this while Kim was speaking. <laughs> I remembered that this just happened the other day. So this is my non-health example. So everything's not health with me. Um, my friend, I happen to live in Oregon. Um, a lot of us work remotely, and um, my friend was interested in becoming a substitute teacher here in Oregon, and I was like, oh, I'll go Google that for you. I don't know what you need to do either to become a substitute teacher, and I just, you know, I did Oregon substitute teacher, um, and I got a lot of different results. Well, this first one, that's what I have open over here. The first result is from teaching-certification.com. Now, I don't think they are trying to be unhelpful 
and I don't think they're purposefully misleading people. But if you look at this dot com, it says that you, oh, you have to have a bachelor's degree and have a first aid card to obtain a restricted substitute teaching license. And I told my friend, hey, it sounds real easy. And then I was like, you know what? To be a good librarian, I should probably go actually check the government website <laughs> for Oregon and make sure that this is true. Let's check more than one source. And sure enough, I went then to Oregon.gov um, and I made sure I was on the Oregon.gov website. So this is the government entity that is in charge of licensing teachers and substitute teachers. I came down here, I was like, yeah, it was talking about a restricted substitute teaching license. And I go there and then unfortunately, oh look, there's a lot more you have to do. You actually have to um, have a letter of sponsorship from an employing school district. So you kind of already have to like know someone <laughs> and you have to have that bachelor's degree, yes, but you also have to pass this exam. And I mean, it was a lot more than just having a bachelor's degree and having a first aid card. So again, I don't think that this other website was is purposefully trying to mislead people. It's just not completely accurate. Um, it does talk about that exam down here, but it doesn't say anything about having that um, letter of sponsorship for your first restricted license. It just wasn't complete information. So the .gov is where I went and I got the full picture and that's who I should have just gone to in the first place. I should have known that as a librarian, <laughs> just go straight to the .gov. Um, so that's just another really good example of, you know, if that was something I was talking about in a, in a discussion post, you know, about the differing requirements for substitute teachers or something, I wouldn't want to cite this .com because it didn't even give the full picture. It's okay if I started there um, and thought, hmm, let me just go double check that. And find the same, make sure I get the same information from a different source and then go to the .gov and realize, here's the full thing. This is what I would actually wanna cite. So that's just another example that came to me <laughs> about using the internet for all different kinds of information sources. And I think we have just a few more questions for you um, before we wrap up. So I'll go ahead and I'll do those um, remaining polls and we'll just kind of do a little knowledge check, see what you've remembered about what we've uh, talked about in this webinar. So our first one is a, just a true or false question. And again, you just click on your answer. It's true or false that educational institutions websites end in .edu. Does that sound like something we talked about maybe tonight? And I'm just going to wait until um, most of you have voted. We really love it when you when you participate with us in our little quizzes here. So I'll give it just a few more seconds and I'll close it in five, four, three, two, one. All right. So everybody got that one right. Yes. Educational institutions websites will end in that .edu. And you should be familiar with that because of your Walden email ending also in .edu. All right, our next question, let me hide that, is when looking at a news site, what of the following can help you figure out if it's satire, if it's fake, or if it's heavily biased? And actually, Kim, I might need your help with this one because I'm not sure I even remember what's right here. We'll let people vote and you can choose as many of those as you want. Which ones of these um, would help you determine if it's fake, satirical, um, or heavily biased? All right, I think I've got like one person who's voted, so I'm gonna wait till at least one more person. <laughs> All right, we're gonna give it five more seconds, two more seconds. Okay, we got some people. So it looks like. So yeah, the about page, that's absolutely correct. Um, and the footer is also correct because yeah. if there is no about, you go down to the footer to see if there's anything there. Um, and um, you could do an online search for information about the site that would help yeah. you, you know, if you go back to that one website I showed where you can, shows you where they are on the realm um, of, biases or where they where they lean lean to. Um, so I think the first three, you know, are, are good answers there. 
Excellent. And yeah, I like that point about about um, I like that you added in the fourth one by clicking on links because it seems like that would help. But, you know, they could have they could be linking to things that are also from the same news site. So right, it doesn't yes. it could just be kind of like a loop that you end up mm -hmm. in. Yep, that's although you could learn you could figure that out. But yeah, I, I see where you're going with that. That's a really good, um, really good answer that you came up with there. <laughs> so um, let's do the next one. Great job with that one. The last two are, are true or false. So this one is true or false. Um, resources I find through the library are just like resources I find on the World Wide Web with a Google search. Are those two things exactly the same? Basically, it's saying um, resources I find are exactly the same. Doesn't matter. Uh, if they come from the library or just on a Google search. And again, I'm going to wait until more people vote this time. I'm going to be a stickler about it this time. I give it at least 25 seconds. So you've got a little bit more time if you want to click on your answer. We don't know who's voting which way. You're not going to get, you know, points taken off your GPA or anything. So you can be wrong. This is very low stakes. All right, I got one more person to interact with this one, so I'll go ahead and close it. And everybody got that right. That is false. They are not the same. Um, the library resources, again, we have, um, we've actually developed this as a collection of resources. So that's a phrase we use in libraries, that we do collection development. And in our case, that means choosing the databases that we're going to pay for. Um, and sometimes we will even link to government websites or other credible sources that are out on the internet, but we have determined that they are needed for certain things or that they are authoritative and trustworthy. Um, so even in that sense, you know, it's not the same as just doing a Google search. You're going to find things through the library that you would not find through that Google search also. All right. And one last question. It's true or false that blogs are a reliable, trustworthy uh, source of health information. I'm really hoping everybody gets this one right. So we'll give this one about 25 seconds also and see if we can get at least one more person this time to vote about whether blogs are a reliable, trustworthy source for health information. Ah, oh, I got one more person. Okay, great. I'm still <laughs> going to give it about five more seconds and close it. All right. Everybody got that right. You know what okay. blogs are a good source of? They're a good source for cute puppy pictures. <laughs> or for recipes. And recipes. <laughs> yep. Or, but read the comments on the recipes because sometimes you'll figure out, oh, it actually is going to take 10 minutes longer than yeah. it says or something like that. So, yes, uh, not a good source for health information. Um, I've even seen, you know, vets that have blogs and it's kind of like, uh, advertising for their veterinary practice. So yeah, I don't even, I don't even like going to a vet blog when it's like a question about my dogs. Um, mm -hmm. So I would rather call my own vet in that case and ask them. So great job with that one, everybody. Thank you for uh, humoring us and and doing those. It's good to know that um, you got some of those skills down. And we do hope that this makes you feel more confident in using internet resources, whether it's for an assignment or just in your daily, everyday life. Um, and before we go, I did want to just point out the Ask a Librarian button. If you have questions about using the library resources, like for instance, if you need help finding scholarly peer-reviewed articles on a topic, great time to use our Ask a Librarian service. It's up here in the top right corner. I just click on that and you can see all the different ways to get in touch with us. Um, if you send us an email through this form, we will give you a time, very timely response. We answer emails typically within 24 hours. Usually it's a lot faster than that, um, but at certain times of the year, like a term start, hint, hint, that's coming up at the end of the month, <laughs> um, <laughs> it might take us the full 24 hours when it's a term start because there are a lot of new students who need our help usually then. But we are very happy to help you. Um, so please do use our Ask a Librarian form if you need um, 
any help using the library. And then just another reminder that we do have that evaluating resources guide and there's the link to it. Uh, Kim showed us a little bit of it. It's a wealth of information really um, for not just evaluating internet resources, but also to think critically about even the scholarly articles that you find through the library. So take a look at that. And again, thank you so much for attending. We are right at time. Um, so we'll stick around to see if there are any questions that we can answer real fast. But other than that, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for coming, everyone.